Good afternoon and welcome to the RespectAbility webinar for 2017, December 6th. Um, my name is Philip Conpoly. I am the Policy and Practices Director for RespectAbility, and it is my delight and my pleasure to be presenting this webinar to you today um, with the folks from Disability Solutions. They are some really innovative leaders when it comes to inclusion and employment for people with disabilities, and some of their work is really remarkable and offers a lot of lessons for all of us who care about about promoting opportunities for the one in five Americans who live with disabilities. Um, so I want to back up a little bit and kind of give you an introduction to the work they do and kind of why I felt that this would be a very valuable conversation to have today. So back two years ago, I had the pleasure of going out to Las Vegas for the Associ National Association of Workforce Development Professionals Conference. And as part of that, I had the opportunity to coordinate a site visit for some of the NAWDUP attendees to a program that was being supported by Disability Solutions um, in a Staples distribution center and a Staples retail shop and a Pepsi only um, And it was really uh, amazing to see their approach to training, their approach to integration and inclusion, um, the efforts that they were making to really let job seekers with disabilities shine. And um, those successes are really remarkable. I know everybody who went to the site visits was amazed and really very intentionally thought about, well, how can I serve a job seeker with a disability through you know, a new opportunity? How can I learn from those lessons? And ultimately, it comes down to the fundamental lesson that we all know that if we find the right jobs for the right people, it can and will succeed. And it goes especially for people with disabilities. And some of the biggest brand names that are out there, Starbucks, Pepsi, Walmart, you know, brand names that are part and parcel of America are companies that have started really the talent that people with disabilities bring. And so I'm very excited to be joined today by Kevin and by Julie from Disability Solutions. They will be walking you through their program. They'll be talking about some of their work, some of their strategies, some of those best practices from leading employers that are really changing minds and driving inclusion in the workplace today. So Kevin, Julie, please take it away. Thank you very much, Philip, and welcome to today's webinar, Changing Minds in Changing Lives Through Disability Inclusion, presented by Disability Solutions. Uh, Philip, again, thank you to you and the RespectAbility team for the invitation to present. Very happy to be here. Uh, so today's webinar will discuss how Disability Solutions, a corporate disability consulting firm, is changing minds and changing lives through our work with Pepsi, Synchrony Financial, Staples, and other employers across the country. Disability Solutions clients have hired over 350 people with disabilities, including veterans, over the past five years through the planning and implementation of a strategic approach focused on driving business results. Julie and I today will discuss best practices and tips on bridging the gap between employers and the community partners who serve all job seekers with disabilities that have produced real outcomes. So as you can see, Disability Solutions is at Ability Beyond. Uh, so Ability Beyond is headquartered in Connecticut and has provided services, all different types of services, for individuals with disabilities for over 60 plus years. As of 2017, we have obtained jobs for 1,300 plus individuals with disabilities nationally. Disability Solutions is a consulting arm of Ability Beyond created to help employers navigate the world of hiring initiatives for job seekers and veterans with disabilities. So Disability Solutions, uh, we are a team of consultants across the country with an array of both business and nonprofit backgrounds. Our client list includes, again, Pepsi, Staples, Synchrony Financial, oops, Synchrony Financial, Aramac, Aon, and more. Uh, Disability Solutions basically partners with our clients who are the employers to create a playbook from A to Z on how to recruit, hire, and retain job seekers and veterans with disabilities for their companies. Our team has a focus on strategy development, partnership development, recruitment, training, compliance, human resources, and more to best prepare our clients, again, the employers, for success. This past October, we recently celebrated our fifth year anniversary. So more on disability solutions. Again, you'll hear a couple times throughout the presentation, our motto is changing minds and changing lives uh, through our clients. We are changing minds and in return changing the lives of those individuals that are employed uh, and specifically have a disability. 
You can learn more about our services, success stories, and more at our website, disabilitytalent.org. And we also have a career center, career center, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Great re resource for both employers looking to hire individuals with disabilities and those job seekers with disabilities out there looking to work with employers or looking for a diverse workforce. So your presenters today, that's me on the left. I am Kevin McCluskey. I am the Director of Partnership Development with Disability Solutions. I am based out of Bethel, Connecticut, where we are headquartered. My focus is training and preparing local employer sites for such an initiative, initiative through Disability 101 trainings and Fear and Stigma trainings. I also assist our clients by building the bridge to the community-based organizations out there, both locally and nationally, to provide the employers, our clients, with a robust and best match pipeline of job seekers with disabilities. On your right is senior consultant, Julie Sawash from Indianapolis, Indiana area. Julie? Hello everyone, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, as Kevin said, my name is Julie Sawash and I'm a senior consultant and I oversee the implementation of the strategies that we help to develop for companies as they start or continue their disability and inclusion journey. Thank you, Julie. So you got a, a good uh, combo presenters here. Uh, Julie does a lot of upfront work with the organizations at a headquarter level, goes through all those wonderful systems, uh, job descriptions, HR, all that fun stuff. And then I, um, on my side, and work with the uh, local employer sites to really find the talent. Uh, so you're going to learn a lot today. All right, so why are we here? Uh, so the hiring of job seekers with disabilities is typically viewed as charity. Disability Solutions and our clients, the employers, are changing that thinking through, again, smart planning and outreach to set the example that hiring individuals with disabilities isn't just the right thing to do. It really does make business sense. So again, our motto is to change minds and change lives through hiring of individuals with disabilities, and our mission follows that lead. Uh, so again, we are here to change the conversation from charity to talent value. Again, we we are talking about a sustainable business model. So it's when the company invests and, and puts time and money into the program, uh, we make sure it works and gets business results with the, what they're looking for. Uh, we have strong case studies, and we're going we're going to talk a little bit about our case studies with uh, Pepsi today and Synchrony Financial and some of the success we've had and continue to have. Uh, we also a part of Disability Solutions' mission is to create a good pipeline of revenue to provide services back to individuals with disabilities to the parent company, Ability Beyond. Uh, so Disability Solutions is out there nationally doing a lot of work, and we're funneling some money back into Ability Beyond, which, again, serves uh, all individuals with disabilities. And again, change the conversation from people with disabilities can't do to what they can do. Very important out there. Again, changing minds. And uh, change the systems from within. Julie's going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, some more people with disabilities nationally can be engaged in meaning, meaningful employment at all levels, uh, from the boardroom to the mailroom. Julie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. So I think it's just the easiest for me to start at the top and give you all a very kind of strategic way that um, we try to talk to businesses uh, about the importance, some of the things that we hear from them that are important to helping them build, remember, a sustainable program that has a good um, business impact and also has a good community impact in, in terms of people getting into work. And so I'm going to give you a really high-level overview of that and a little bit about what we do up front in strategy development, turn it back over to Kevin to talk about the really cool stuff in partnership development and actually getting people to work. And so really we see a, four basic building blocks of why companies want to start to engage in our community. And the first one, and, and we'll kind of get into this a little bit, just so everyone has a good understanding, it's a, a pretty complex piece of information, but is affirmative action compliance. So that's section 503 and 4212, which we'll get into here in a few minutes, um, about why people or why companies who have contracts with the federal government um, are required to start hiring in, in our community. And the second piece is, you know, we're really at a full employment rate right now, and there's a lot of talent in the disability community that has been untapped and really bring a diverse perspective into uh, a, new, in a workforce. 
Um, and, and additionally, we know that a good portion of our population is actually aging into a disability. And you know, the, the next thing is brand. Companies want to be seen as what's different about them. And part of that is their employer brand, how they engage their workforce, how they attract uh, new and innovative job seekers and employees. And part of that is with a great positive culture that's inclusive of all types of diversity. And the last reason is just kind of as I talked about before, we are a growing market. We have a consumer um, disposable income of over 650 billion. Um, and when you think about not just us as a community, but then our family and friends, um, that's a lot of income that can be spent on brands that really want to uh, impact our community in a positive way, nearly $4 trillion annually. And I love to call out some companies that are already doing some great work. Kevin is going to talk about my two favorite from an employment perspective, PepsiCo and Synchrony Financial. And, and we're so proud of the work that we've done with them, but really how they've owned this and created initiatives that live and breathe within their organizations. I love to call out Duracell and Guinness also from a marketing perspective. Duracell has some awesome commercials with Derek Coleman from the Seattle Seahawks. And Guinness has done a series of commercials about integrating disability into everyday life from sports to hanging out and having a Guinness and drinking a beer. And then we'll kind of talk about the fun, cool stuff, right? Everyone loves who's hiring, who's marketing, um, but it's really, I think, important to understand the very base. And, and this is not, when we talk to companies, we don't want companies to just want to be compliant, but we know that that's important to them. So we say that basically compliance is the reporting of all of your diversity activities. And I'll, I'll step back here for just a second. So when I'm talking about compliance, I'm talking about federal contractors. So most companies in the United States, Fortune 1000 companies are known as federal contractors. That means they have a contract with the federal government to provide a good or service and or they are a subcontractor, which means that company helps to provide a good or service to the primary contractor. And so there are about 250,000 federal contractor establishments in the country. Um, an example is a Home Depot. Home Depot is a federal contractor. Each Home Depot location is a location or an establishment that has its own set of affirmative action requirements. And in 2012, we saw some updated regulations to Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act that really took away the non-measure of how people with disabilities are doing in federal contractors. So prior to 2011, the requirement was good faith outreach. Hey, I reached out to my vocational rehabilitation office and told them I'd like to hire some people with disabilities. I posted my jobs here and that's all I did. And the director of the Office of Federal Contractor Compliance at the time said, hey, good faith outreach is really not getting us to results. The employment measure for people with disabilities has not changed significantly in the past 30 years. We need to do more. And so with that, they put together a group of goals that are now the updated regulations. And the goal for hiring people with disabilities, it's neither a floor nor a ceiling, so it's just a goal, is that 7% of your location by position or job grouping will be people with disabilities. And that's a, it's a pretty lofty goal, um, but in our opinion, it's, it's a, an achievable goal as well, because we know that one in five people in the United States has a disability now, and that number is probably gonna increase to one in four. The additional things that were put in place are to increase measures so that we know if the dial is moving and what companies are moving the dial forward and what companies need to be encouraged to do more. And so the other pieces of section 503 are around self-ID. So if you have a person who's applying for a job and you are asked um, to self-ID as a person with a disability or a veteran, that, per that organization is a federal contractor. The next piece is to take a survey of employees to learn demographic information on a regular basis 
to provide training and record keeping to your existing employee base, and then also to do an evaluation of the sources of your applicants. So um, I think this is really important from a partner perspective or a community-based organization perspective. If you are sending in job seekers to a company, that company is required to evaluate the quality and quantity of job seekers that are coming through their pipeline from each source. So that's a really great way to be a valuable um, addition to a local organization's, a local company's recruiting activities. And then we have also in 2012, similar changes to Section 4212, which are directly related to veterans, what we call protected veterans. Um, I like to think about it more generally as veterans, but this includes veterans who have recently separated, who've had extended periods of unemployment, or have any disability rating. It's, it's broader than that, but just to keep it simple. And for them, the benchmark is a little bit different. So for people with disabilities, it's 7% by location, by job grouping. For veterans, companies are required to hit a hiring benchmark. So all of their hires for the year should be 6.8% veterans. And that number changes just a little bit every year based on the number of, of veterans of a working age that we have in the population at a given time. They are also required to list their jobs with the State Workforce Agency, which we think is an amazing and underutilized resource. Same thing with a self-ID, which we'll take a look at in a minute, and also to make sure that they have that record keeping in place. And then my favorite piece, and I think for us the most important piece for us to talk about from a application and how people with disabilities get to work is the Internet Applicant Rule. It's also a part of the same organization, the Office of Federal, Federal Contractor Compliance, that <clears throat> put 503 and 4212 in place, also have created standards on how we measure who an, an applicant is, who a job seeker is that's really interested in the job. And from that, regulation in, in 2008, I believe, what we really saw happen was an extreme um, growth in application tracking, or applicant tracking systems, so everyone moved to that online system. And there are hundreds, several hundred um, applicant tracking systems in the United States, and it makes how people apply much more complicated um, and creates additional challenges and opportunities for people with disabilities. I think we, we have all been to the place where we've gone and we've applied to the job and have gone into a black hole. And the Internet Applicant Rule, very complicated, so I'm just going to be really quick. It just helps the company to define who an applicant is for affirmative action. And that means there are three requirements for being an applicant. The person expresses interest. That means they complete an application in the appropriate format most likely online in the applicant tracking system. They meet the basic qualifications for an employment, for employment, and they do not self-select out. And that's really easy to do, to self-select out if you don't complete an application, if you don't answer some of the basic quali qualifying questions, excuse me, um, correctly, then you have self-selected out of the process. And that means that your application may not be seen by a hiring manager. So those are important things for our community to think about, how to understand um, how important it is to apply for a job in a way that is going to um, get you the highest possibility of getting in front of those hiring managers. And really the last thing on compliance is this is the actual form that you'll see. It's a government form from the OMB. Not very inviting, um, but you will see it as you apply and then on the first day of employment as well and you have the opportunity to select if you are a person with a disability or a veteran or if you choose not to disclose or you are not one of those individuals. And then switching over then really from compliance and understanding the market value. I like to talk a little bit about what we do, just so that when Kevin goes into the implementation, it gives you an idea of how we've gathered our information and how we've gotten to some of our outcomes. And we start with the discovery process. 
very kind of standard consulting procedure is we need to learn who a company is, what systems they use, what their processes are, and what their culture is like uh, to really understand how best to source and identify candidates and then move them through those applicant tracking systems so we get to success. From there, we really focus on those learnings and putting together recommendations, plays, and impact areas so that when a company is building a strategy, they see out of the gate a tangible and intangible impact on business drivers. Some of those impact areas might be brand, they might be around recruitment gaps, improving culture and engagement within their organization. And from there, we really help them to build a comprehensive strategy that they can lift and shift throughout their enterprise to make sure that they can hire people with disabilities in an effective and meaningful way. And that's really the candidate experience, the vendor process, and the internal processes and policies that both hinder or promote uh, great growth for talent with disabilities once they're in the door. And then finally, from there, we design a strategy or design and build a program based off of what we learned in that strategy. And Kevin's really gonna get into the meat of this, so I'm not gonna take time from him, but there are lots of different ways to then put that strategy into place. And for us, one of the most important pieces is to make sure that those results are measurable and that we can have a positive impact that champions within companies can go forward with and give a good business reasons for growing programs like these. Kevin, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Julie. Uh, so deliver and go live. So Julie went through some of the upfront work we do with these these companies, being the employers. Uh, and what would what we do is we find out we do a lot of education up front with the with these companies. Uh, they all all the companies we work with are very interested in hiring individuals with disabilities and starting a program. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, fears. There's a lot of stigma. And there's a lot of unknowns. So our job is really again to help them navigate through those waters. Uh, and a lot of things we often hear are, you know, what jobs can people with disabilities do? And I'm sure a majority on the phone call can say, you know, any job that they're qualified for or want to do. Uh, now we also hear we are only hiring people with disabilities for these jobs, you know, maybe your janitorial job or something like that. Uh, we here at Disability Solutions, you know, we work with the employer to see what their needs are and we help them find, you know, individuals who meet their business needs and they so happen to have some type of disability. Uh, so we, we find individuals who are the best match for those positions. So we are looking for all jobs. And as you'll see, uh, anywhere from entry level to management is what we're, we're looking to hire. Uh, we also, we started in Pepsi, so we often heard a lot of people with disabilities can't lift things or can't physically do any of these jobs. Again, a myth, a fear. Uh, so again, we use a lot of education up front to you know, really prepare these employers uh, for hiring individual disabilities and finding the right talent for their business needs. Uh, so some of the education is really what is a disability? Uh, so it's important to understand the wide range of people uh, this talent pool represents. Uh, so as, as Philip said earlier, one in five people in the United States have some type of disability and are also are facing challenges in getting hired. Uh, so we always say the term disability includes but is not limited to people with hidden disabilities such as depression, PTSD, anxiety disorders, ADD, ADHD, uh, developmental disabilities such as Down syndromes, physical disabilities that impact mobility, dexterity, vision or hearing, and disabilities due to metal conditions, uh, injuries or aging such as Parkinson's, stroke, brain injury or cancer. So again, we use this opportunity to educate the employers of all the different types of disabilities out there and again, all the talent that's out there. Uh, so, you know, many believe that, you know, since most disabilities are physical or visually impairing, uh, the truth is that about 70% of uh, all disabilities are hidden. Sorry, but yeah, 70% of disabilities are hidden. Uh, so a large percentage of individuals with disabilities, including those aging into disability for the first time, as well as those veterans with disabilities um, returning home to civilian workforce. We also, you know, everyone nowadays seems to like celebrities, so we also talk about celebrities with disabilities. 
uh, Justin Timberlake, uh, Olympic record breaker Michael Phelps, Apple Steve Jobs, and actually, actually our own Keith Meadows, who is a hiring and engagement consultant with Disability Solutions. Uh, so many, many different types of disabilities out there, and again, a huge talent pool. Also with that education, you know, we go over Disability 101, then we also talk about person-first language. Uh, so as we continue to educate employers, we start with a simple, uh, to me a little simple, but yet important piece on how to address a person with a disability. So as you'll hear throughout this presentation, we use person-first language. Uh, and I always, you know, I always tell my mom, don't be worried if you, you know, still say some of these terms or, you know, you're getting used to saying something different. It, it does take time to break old habits. Um, so we, when we address a person with a disability, we often hear uh, the disabled, we hear the handicapped, uh, the cringe-worthy R-word, differently abled, special people, or challenged people. Um, so all of these are often used, you know, all the time and, and some, always have a little negative side to them if you think about it. Um, so when you say if there's a disabled car on the highway, it means the car doesn't work or it's not function, functioning properly. Uh, so calling a person disabled, we really think it's kind of the same thing. So that's why we choose putting the, the person first before the disability or really just keeping the disability off altogether. Uh, so again, disabled Keith versus Keith with a disability is a little different. Again, it's a small educational piece to get our employers and people not only thinking differently but talking differently as well. So it's a minor first step. Um, so you'll hear us throughout this presentation saying job seekers with disabilities, again, putting the individuals first. So market value, Julie touched a little bit on this, I believe. Uh, so again, going in, educating employers that there is a market value out there. So as many of you might know, the individuals with disabilities are the largest minority in the United States. So currently, again, um, you know, one in five Americans have a disability. It's really approaching one in four. Uh, and that being the largest minority pool in America also has a huge spending power worth $796 billion. So think about that as an employer or a company. In addition, 70 million families have at least one member with a disability, 70 million families. Studies also show that 87% of individuals prefer to spend money on businesses that hire people with disabilities. I, also, I often compare uh, the disability community to the NASCAR, NASCAR community, you'll see when uh, NASCAR fans go into a, a um, grocery store or something like that and they look, they always look at the product a little differently and see if there's that NASCAR logo on it. They do support uh, the NASCAR brand and much like that, um, you know, in families and individuals with disabilities are, are very loyal to the companies that they know support, companies who hire and, and support individuals with disabilities, also fostering inclusion. Uh, so they, they consciously select their products and serv um, services over competitors. Uh, I myself am definitely a victim to that. Um, I don't know if a victim is the right word, but I was a Coca-Cola drinker my whole life. I, I definitely prefer a Coke over Pepsi. I'm not going to lie. Julie, don't yell at me. But since I've been working with Pepsi for the last five years, I definitely choose their products over Coke now, definitely. Um, you know, Again, Coke versus Pepsi, I'm not going to go there, but I, I do select Pepsi products. They have a wonderful array of different you know, types of soft drinks and waters, and I drink Aquafina water because it's a Pepsi brand. I, I do support that, and working with their employees and their leadership throughout these five years, I see, I see it a little differently of what goes into actually making those products and the, the people that do the hard work. Um, so I, I definitely um, spend my money on Pepsi and others as well. So again, we, we, we prove to the employer and our clients that's not just the right thing to do. It does make business sense and helps the bottom line. Let's talk about some of the work we've done through some case studies. Again, uh, two of our clients are Synchrony Financial and PepsiCo. So PepsiAc, and PepsiAc was our first customer. I always say it's not a, not a bad first customer to have as a new business. Uh, and with them, we created Pepsi Act, which stands for Achieving Change Together. And we came together, Pepsi and Disability Solutions, to create Pepsi Act to actively recruit, train, hire, and most importantly, retain individuals with all types of disabilities, including veterans with disabilities within all areas of Pepsi's operations. So a couple, a couple of big things there is retain. Uh, we don't want to just get numbers. We want to make sure that individuals we're bringing onto these companies 
are staying. They're they're qualified for these jobs. They can do these jobs, and they can be successful in these jobs. So we really, um, at Pepsi and us, really wanted to make sure we are retaining individuals. And another part of that sentence there is in within all areas of Pepsi's operations. So we're not again not just looking for some janitorial work or something like that. We are again hiring anywhere from entry level all the way up to management. So working with Pepsi to do that. All right, so the rationale with Pepsi, one thing uh, early on in those strategic meetings with Pepsi, again, it, it takes a lot of planning up front to really maneuver these initiatives and we wanna make sure we're doing it properly through education and, and doing it the right way. Uh, so one thing that really hit me early on in those meetings was Pepsi realized they want to do this as a business model because, it, 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 again, it makes sense. They saw the value in it, and when you put dollars and time and, and manpower behind something that you're invested in, uh, you look for those results and you get those results. It's not, again, it's not charity. It's not something that can be cut easily through the bottom. It's something that's really a business and makes, makes sense. Another thing that really, really hit me was um, one of their, their top management said they wanted their workforce to reflect their community. Uh, within each site. So again, individual disability is a huge minority pool out there. They wanted to, the, their workforce to reflect their community. So that really hit me. I, I thought that was really great. And the rationale behind the Pepsi Act was, again, strengthening the workforce. Uh, so as we've, as we've seen with individual disabilities, there's lower ap uh, absences, there's turno lower turnover, there's more morale, it raises awareness, increases that loyalty. And on the bottom is that old you know, regulation stuff that Julie talked about. And then uh, broadening the, the consumer base, again, that market value, uh, that huge spending power, you know, at least one, one, um, 20 million families have at least one member with a disability, and again, reflect the community in which they operate. So it really, it really embodied the uh, performance with purpose, which is one of Pepsi's mottos. So Pepsi Act, again, launched uh, roughly four and a half years ago or so. Uh, and since then, we've launched nine sites total. Uh, we're about to get two more in 2018. Uh, we piloted it in Houston and Burnsville, Minnesota. Uh, I piloted there. One was a non-union, one was a union. Was really some of the some of the reasons behind that. Houston is a huge facility. Burnsville also a large facility servicing the Minneapolis area. Uh, our third site was in Las Vegas. Actually, let me go back a little bit. Houston and Burnsville were uh, MW sites, so basically warehouse distribution sites. Our third site was Las Vegas, where we, it was a certified center. Certified center is a very unique facility to Pepsi. Basically, they take in their marketing equipment, which is coolers, vending machines, and fountain drink machines, and refurbish them there. Uh, so we opened a brand new facility there, had huge success. Our fourth site was Winston-Salem, and they switched it up on us. We did a call center down there. So it's one of two call centers that Pepsi has in the United States. Uh, and it, obviously unique and different jobs for individuals with disabilities. And then Phoenix, Nashville, Orlando, Indianapolis, and Denver were uh, the last five, and those are also uh, MW distribution sites. So over the about four and a half years or so, uh, we've hired 285 plus uh, individuals with disabilities, which is great throughout the country. I think we're up to actually 287 as of this week. Uh, over 10 distinct roles, again, we're looking entry level to management. Uh, we've hired anywhere from a, a warehouse loader picking orders in, an, an, a, in a warehouse to a sales rep, uh, to call center reps, uh, call center sales reps, all the way up to a manager, um, a manager in Las Vegas managing about 15 to 20 different employees. Uh, so all across the board. We have a 14% hiring retention rate higher than their national average. So the individuals we are finding for them are staying, which is, again, a part of that huge uh, mission in, to begin with for Pepsi Act. 20% uh, of those individuals we hired of the 285 are veterans with disabilities. And the Pepsi Act has also received uh, local and national recogni recognition. And uh, we've been talking through some conferences over the last couple of years as well. Uh, so great work there. Those four individuals pictured are actually, uh, again, individuals that came through the Pepsi Act program. They just did an internal marketing uh, push to get some self-IDs. So our individuals that we worked with are part of that video. And again, proud to be working for Pepsi and put on that blue and nice yellow uniform in that, in that case. Our other client is Synchrony Financial. 
Uh, so Synchronized Financial is a bank. One second, sir. So uh, uh, I'm sorry. We recently, our team collaborated with Synchronized Financial, and we piloted it in Dayton, Ohio. So we worked with their Synchronized Call Center. We're able to source talented individuals with disabilities for, again, a variety of different positions. Uh, as you might know, they are a bank, but they're also a large provider of private labeled credit cards in the United States, such as um, they're behind the companies uh, Walmart, Sam's Club, Amazon. So if you have some of those credit cards, Synchrony Financial handles those. And uh, two of the positions we work with across uh, Dayton, Ohio, were the customer service rep handling inbound customer calls and the collections representatives. Uh, handling inbound and outbound to, you know, get those customers up to speed on their payments and whatnot. So we had a truly great, uh, tremendous success in placing individuals with a wide variety of disabilities into positions. Uh, so going back a little bit to Pepsi and those warehouse positions are really physical. Call centers are a little different. Um, you, you're able to tap into a, a different pool of um, talent with disabilities. So in with Synchrony Financial, we hired 60 plus, and we're up to 68 actually, hires in Dayton, Ohio, and uh, just over a year with those 68. Multiple types of disabilities again. Uh, so as mentioned before, these hires individuals with a wide variety of disabilities. We have employees who are blind, we have visual impairments, using JAWS software and other adaptive accommodations. Employees have recently acquired physical disabilities due to previous jobs. Uh, also, there's new employees who have struggled with mental health and have hidden disabilities. Uh, mentioned like before, anxiety, depression, PTSD. Uh, so as you can see, we were able to beat the company average again for um, the retention with our pilot. Uh, truly significant for those employers out there who are struggling with an elevated turnover. The project in Ohio was so successful that Synchrony has expanded into their Phoenix location. Uh, we've been there for about seven months of hiring, and we are up to, I believe, 18 hires to date at actually at this point. Uh, so the expansion site also doing very well, and uh, Synchrony is actually looking for a company-wide expansion of the program uh, into 2018. So very excited to work with them, uh, and again, also receiving some local and national recognition with them. Uh, so again, our, our job is really to find the best talent for our clients, the employers, working with community-based organizations across the board. Uh, and you know, sometimes we hear a lot of horror stories uh, from these job seekers that we work with, and I'm sure some of you have heard before. Uh, so this is Julie out in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, you know, some of these stories are really heartbreaking about interviews candidate in a wheelchair arriving for an interview should never know they are out of contention for the job before they even speak one word. Uh, but it happens a lot to individuals with different types of disability on a daily basis uh, during this interview process. Uh, the great news is that it does not happen with Synchrony Financial. The larger lesson is that inclusion works basically. Um, with our economy approaching full employment and employers continue struggling to fill important jobs, especially in the call center environment, Individuals with disabilities remain the largest untapped labor pool out there in the United States. So when uh, we see employers realize that employees uh, are there and can succeed and thrive in these positions, it's a win-win for everyone. Uh, so we, we encourage companies to give individuals with disabilities the opportunity for employment and business, and uh, they'll be enriched and rewarded in many ways from culture and diversity all the way to the bottom line. So I'm going to... Some more success stories, that's Mark Lang. Uh, he's one of the, the top sales performers here in, in uh, Dayton, Ohio. And that's Pete, an individual who uh, has some hearing impairments. Uh, he worked in the, as a forklift driver in Detroit, Michigan for 16 years, went out to Las Vegas, couldn't find a job because of his disability. He was struggling to get his foot in the door. Uh, he also struggled with the interview process because he never really went through an interview process before. So I work with him a lot one-on-one -on -one over the phone through the through emails, preparing him for his interview with Pepsi, uh, and he just recently celebrated his third year anniversary in September. So I'm looking at the clock. It is 12, or 2.12 right now, my time. So we have about 18 minutes left. I want to say we're going to leave about five minutes for questions. So at this point, if you do have any questions, feel free to message us, and the moderator will 
uh, take some of those questions for us and we'll try to answer them at the end of the presentation. And you can type your questions directly in the chat box on the bottom left. Thank you. All right, I'm going to show a quick video right now of our work with uh, Synchrony Financial. Actually, that is that is uh, the night, not the right video. I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. Um, not a problem. Sorry about that. Tell you what, let's keep going with the slides, and then um, we'll put a we'll post we'll send everybody along with the PowerPoint um, the direct video link. So sorry for the technical hiccup. Yeah, so. <laughs> not not a problem. All right, so the proof is in the pudding. Again, our, our clients have seen uh, a lot of great goals, and that's what we're all about. Again, Julie, Julie and I work with a lot of upfront work, and then you know, putting the initiative to work and getting those results. Uh, Disability Solutions really is happy about the results we have uh, to continue to push these initiatives across the country. Uh, so our projects focused on disability and hiring have a higher retention. Again, we're about 14% higher than our client's average retention across the board. We've worked with our clients to hire individuals with disabilities from the mailroom to the boardroom, like I said, entry-level warehouse jobs to department managers. And for those uh, employers worried about the OFCCP audits, our clients have seen a 50% increase of self-disclosures. So again, we know that we're hiring and increasing that individual disabilities to get hired. Uh, we also promote that there's diversity within disabilities. Uh, disabilities don't discriminate. Much like the veteran population, disability includes all different types of groups, uh, black, African-American, white, Caucasian, Hispanic, Asians, and women as well, including veterans too. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the education we do as far as partnerships. Uh, so again, these companies are looking for talented individuals, uh, employees, and we have talented individuals with disabilities that need jobs. So it's really a perfect match, as we like to say. Uh, so partnerships, we, we educate the employers on research and development, those partners, bridging the gap between, again, the, the community-based organizations out there and the employers, how to increase the pipeline and support and feedback. So we educate them on different types of partners. What we saw early on uh, when we started Disability Solutions is there are many different partners out there and many, many different employers are looking for a, a, a bigger pipeline of talent coming through the door. Uh, so what we did is, as far as partnership development, we made sure we reached out to all those community partners in the area and really found out what they, what they have in that area, what's their talent look like, and is it a good match for our employers. And again, basically educate and build that bridge between the employers and the companies. So we like to talk about community-based organizations. We call them partners as well. So you got your state and county partners, such as VR, workforce centers. There's nationally known, Goodwill, Easter Seals and also veteran groups that serve uh, veterans with disabilities, such as the VA and the Wounded Warrior Project. Uh, so we make sure the, and we help the, our employers and clients reach out and start doing some research on, on different partners in their area. So again, rather than focusing on one or two partners that might have the right talent for you, there's about 50 to 75 different community-based organizations in one area serving job seekers with disabilities. Uh, so we help them with their research and again, promote multiple partnerships and then we begin the outreach. And the outreach, uh, again, uh, again, just a little bit, but we, we like to make sure they are open to partnership, open to, hey, working with these partners. They have the talent. We need talent. How can we make it happen? Uh, so we like them to do a meet and greet at their facility, really go over the jobs, meet their staff, uh, see the facility, take a tour. Uh, we, we make sure they mean what you say, mean what they say. As uh, Julie said before, you know, some organizations just, you know, post their jobs on the job board and hope that everything works out. Uh, we really wanted to take a, you know, a 180 approach rather than community-based organizations seeking out the employers. We want the employers to turn around and start seeking out the organizations that serve these job seekers. Um, so we, we encourage them to listen to their partners. What do the partners do? Again, there's many different partners out there. Each have, you know, it might not just serve job seekers, they might have some other benefits, uh, there's tax credits and all that good stuff that we'll talk about in a little bit. We also make them 
make sure uh, to make those partners feel important, like they're a part of the project. Uh, then we talk about bridging the gap. How do we do that? Uh, so most of, I believe it's a lot of providers on the on the call today and probably use the old beg, place, pray model. So you beg a company to, you know, you got a great hard worker that, you know, really needs a job, good guy, he's going to be great. Uh, they, so you beg the company, the employer to hire that individual. You place them, they hire them, and you just really pray that it all works out. Uh, so sometimes it does, most likely it doesn't. Uh, so we really want to, again, turn around where it's a 180, the employer and the community organization is working together, again, to make sure it's the best match for that individual. We don't want to uh, set up an individual or job seeker in the wrong job, uh, something they're not qualified, something they're not interested in. Uh, so we really want to use that opportunity to educate and make sure the employer and the community-based organizations are working together um, to find the right best match individual for that job. Uh, so we encourage the employers to not just give a job description, but talk about a day in the life. So this is a, on your bottom right, the day in the life of a warehouse loader at Pepsi. The video that explains, you know, what the job is, it shows the individual doing the job. It shows it's a physical job, so it's not fit for everyone. It's long hours. There's a lot of lifting. So, again, it shows what the job is and, and exactly what it is. So if I read the warehouse loader job description on the website, I'm, you know, I could do that, sure. But when you see it, it's a whole different world. So we encourage companies to really show the community-based organizations what's the job all about, what are the day-to-day -day activities, what they really need to do. Uh, the applicant lifestyle, uh, we look at the, you know, what, what's it like to go online? Is it an online application? What's that application look like? Is there videos? Is there an uh, online assessment that you have to take? Uh, is there questions I shouldn't ask? ask or should not answer the right way, is it, what are their knockout questions, all that good stuff, all the way to hiring, what's the actual interview process look like, what's the you know um, job offer process look like, all that stuff. So again, educating the community-based organizations, therefore educating the job seeker on what that looks like. And then hiring needs. Uh, we, we struggle sometimes to get the employers to really figure out what their hiring needs are. You know, when when's the spike? When's a uh, spike in the season? Is there you know no hiring during the Christmas holidays and stuff like that? Uh, so we really want to know what their needs are. How many they're going to need? When are these jobs posting? When should we apply? All that good stuff. So increasing the pipeline. I always have to put a Tom Cruise reference in my my slides. It's just a part of my contract with Julie. Uh, so, again, increasing the pipeline. So a lot of these companies are really struggling to find the right talent for their group, uh, for, their for their company. So we encourage these, company these companies to really, again, reach out to multiple um, partners in the area and continue to increase that pipeline, finding the right talent in that pipeline. So when these jobs open, these, you're interviewing, you're finding the right talent. And how do we increase the pipeline? And we, when we talk about increasing the pipeline, we want qualified individuals in there. Uh, so in some cases with both Pepsi and Synchronic Financial, we worked with the community organizations in those areas to set up training and recruiting programs. Uh, so we went out with these employers and we had open house events where job seekers who were interested in these types of jobs came, talked to the employers, talked to us, uh, learned a little bit about the job. And at that point, you decide whether it's a good fit for you or it's not a good fit for you. Um, important to realize that this isn't something you, do, you don't want to do. It's, it's just as equal as important to discovering a job that you do want to do. Uh, so we, we did open houses. We also did some trainings. So we did soft skills trainings, um, really interview prep to make sure these individuals go into a job with uh, interview with Pepsi or Synchrony Financial and be prepared to answer questions. Um, there is... Uh, Behavioral-based questions like, you know, tell me about a mistake you've made. Uh, those questions are hard. Most people say, oh, I never made a mistake in my life, which is not the answer the companies are looking for. They want to see an answer where, you know, you, you can say you made a mistake, think me a real-life situation, and how you improved on that. Uh, so we work with the job seekers and the community-based organizations to really prepare those job seekers for success in interviews. We also do job retention skills in those in those programs as well. Um, you know, how to ask for time out, how to deal with a difficult um, coworker, all that stuff that happens in the workplace that ends up being a a reason that individual is, does not keep that job. So again, we do some upfront training again to make sure they're prepared for the job, make sure it's a good fit for them, walk them through the interview process, application process, and once they get the job, again, we want to make sure they retain the job. So we're helping. Uh, through education and make sure these job seekers are prepared. On the left is a HR, Pepsi's HR, talking to a wonderful group in Phoenix. 
On your right is Pepsi Las Vegas. We had the opportunity to bring a, a group of about 25 individuals into the Pepsi's facility and basically play around with their equipment, tinker with it a little bit to see if it was a good fit for them. And again, some people, day one, hour within, they're like, nope, not a good fit for me. I want to work for Pepsi, but the job is not a good fit for me. Uh, others who were interested and realized they could and were very interested in the position. So very good to do that upfront, upfront work with the employer and the community-based organizations. Also attending career fairs and hiring events. Uh, you know, we've all put on a career fair one time and hardly anyone shows up. It's kind of a bust. So we really, we really work with both the community-based organizations and employers to make sure we're getting the most out of those career fairs and hiring events. Uh, we've also worked with uh, Synchrony a few times on doing hiring events in-house. Uh, so we set up a set up a um, hiring event on site so the job seekers who are interested come learn about the job and can even get jobs um, offers on the spot. So Jill, oops, sorry, Jill, I'm going to throw it over to you to talk a little bit about our career center. Great. So I actually I saw one question in the the chat that I can answer on, on this slide. So thanks for that, Kev. Um, so one way that we track outcomes is to use our career center. And we really want to have this be a great benefit to the companies that we work with so that they can see the talent with disabilities that are coming through their pipeline and how they're doing in, in that applicant pipeline. And so we started a career center just a little over a year ago where companies that we work with or that are just really interested in hiring can post their jobs. And one thing that was really important to us is that people with disabilities feel comfortable setting up their profiles and applying to jobs through this source when they may not yet be comfortable self-disclosing. So they can set up a resume, or resume in the database that is anonymous unless an employer reaches out to them and they choose to make that resume and their name available. They can set up job alerts. If you really want to work for Pepsi, which is an amazing company, or Synchrony Financial, um, you can be notified when those jobs are open. And this is, again, just kind of two wins. Great for the job seeker who's interested in starting to engage companies that are really serious about hiring people with disabilities but also helps to give another way to track our outcomes in the company's applicant tracking system through source codes and drop downs to make sure that the efforts that the companies are engaging in are, are showing fruits for that. Thanks, Kev. Thanks, Julie. All right, we've got about five minutes left, so I'm going to run through some of these quick slides and I'll probably leave us a couple minutes for questions. Uh, so we also work with the employers and the, the community-based organizations to learn about the tax incentives, either locally or national. You know, the national ones, uh, WOTC, WOTC. Also talk about that spending power again, working with the community-based organizations. Uh, communication is probably the biggest key to these relationships, as it is to all relationships. Uh, so we all, always celebrate the wins. You know, those one, that first hire, that second hire, always great to, great to get the ball running. Learn from mistakes is huge. You know, you always want to continue to see what's not working, what is working, and educate yourself on that. So once it's not working, how can we make it work? What are the solutions? Uh, feedback, really honest, honest and open communication from both sides is helpful to getting that job seeker, uh, those job seekers in the door. Uh, the trick of retention. So again, we want to make sure these individuals are staying on the job. Uh, this is from Pepsi Burnsville. Uh, we had an individual who was struggling early on and didn't seem like he was going to be successful, but they worked with him really as they would anyone else who was struggling early on. And that employee has, you know, that individual just celebrated his second year anniversary. So once you put a little investment in the, in the beginning to the struggling new employees, they are able to be successful and productive uh, later on. We also talk, a lot, a lot of companies get scared of this next word, which is accommodations. Instead of accommodations, we preach natural supports. So really, just how you treat any other employee, whether they have a disability or not, uh, mentorships, additional training that they need something, really support, you know, how, how are things going, any, do you need help with anything, just those kind of, that kind of support, uh, really an inclusive environment is really helpful to making that employee successful. Uh, we also talk about ruling them in rather than ruling them out. So how can we find a way, you know, with Pepsi there's 30, 60, 90, uh, goals they had to hit, we were working with them to say, you know, what, what if we stretch it out to 45 days? What can we do to get this person where they need to be? Sometimes they couldn't get there, sometimes they could, but we want to make sure we're, we're, you know, again, ruling them in rather than ruling them out. 
And again, a lot of employers get scared of accommodations, but they also usually forget about reasonable accommodations. That's the word that usually goes before it, or should go before it. And we like to call this adjustment of differences. Uh, so in the, the call center facilities, we saw screen readers, we saw service dogs, uh, we've seen adjusted schedules. The gentleman on the right, a veteran from uh, the Gulf War, worked at Pepsi and he had you know VA appointments that were very hard to come through. So when he had one, they were able to adjust his schedule um, a new chair, a desk, hearing aid, braille, large print materials, refrigeration for medication, very easy, reasonable accommodations. And again, for attention, it's all about communication. Celebrate those wins, learn from the mistakes, and use a team approach. Don't just have one individual in charge of the whole program. We work with department managers, hiring managers, HR, all the way up leadership uh, to make sure we have a team approach and figuring out, again, what's not working, what is working, and again, celebrating those wins. I breezed through some of those last slides for time, and uh, now we will open it up to a couple minutes of questions and answers. We got the questions. You got the questions. We got the answers. Great. Thank you. So I've got a bunch of questions in the chat box, but before I read those out, um, operator, could you just quickly uh, tell anybody who's joining us by phone how to submit a question? Yes, well, up. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. If you have dialed in and would like to ask a question, Please press seven pound on your phone now and you will be placed in the queue in the order received. Just listen for your name to be announced and ask your question when prompted. Wonderful, thank you. So first up from uh, Delbert Wetter, we have a great question. Uh, it goes like this. Within departments or offices of larger corporations, which of you found to be most successful points of entry to begin conversations about the disability market and disability talent? The obvious one that comes to mind is the HR department for employment, but what about other instances with brand engagement or marketing? Julie, you want me to handle that one? Sure, go for it. Sure. So, yeah, the engagement is, is pretty tough, uh, definitely. It's all about sales up front, right? Uh, so HR usually is the way to go. Um, again, with disability solutions, we usually start at a headquarter level, and, you know, we, they let them dictate it from there and where we're going to go, where we're going to pilot the program. Uh, you know, piloting a program basically means there's going to be a lot of, you know, things that aren't going to work. So it's a, that's why it's a pilot. So our Houston and Burnsvilles, we learned a lot. We learned so much going on to those two sites into the next um, seven sites. It was a different, you know, whole different approach we had. Um, so HR definitely is a good start locally. Um, if you can get someone who's in charge of that branch or someone in that corporation at the top, you know, it def definitely filters down uh, to get that buy-in. Um, like I say, with partnership development, I may work with a certain company or organization in Minnesota, but when I go to Las Vegas, it's someone totally different, and just because it's the same organization doesn't mean it's going to be the same approach. Um, so it's just finding the right person, basically. It could be anyone in HR. It could be anyone at the top. Um, but you really got to find someone that's bought in and going to listen to you and, and understand the benefits of uh, hiring initiative for individuals with disabilities. Wonderful. Um, and so then the next question comes from Chris Bailey, who asks a twofold question. Um, where do you find job seekers, and how do you track hires? Good. So I, I think Julie touched on tracking hires a second ago, but we can talk a little bit, a bit more. Uh, as far as finding the job seekers, so I'll give you an example in Phoenix. So I work with um, both Synchrony and Pepsi in the Phoenix world. Uh, and when we, when I do out, I first do that research. So I go online, I work with companies or organizations I work with before, try to get the referrals. Um, so if I work with a local rehab business rep in, you know, um, Minnesota, I ask them for the Phoenix one, and then I start developing developing those relationships. Again, there's in, in larger cities and smaller cities, there's about 50 to 75 organizations that serve job seekers with disabilities. So we really reach out to all of them. Uh, usually do a blast email. Uh, we do a survey monkey sometimes on, on what their company organization is all about. And then we start hitting them through uh, phone calls and really just promoting what we're doing, what the company is looking to do, and to see if they're interested in doing it. Uh, most of the time, obviously, we're looking to hire individuals they serve. So uh, they're definitely interested in it. Um, so then I work with the, the community-based organizations to educate them on the, what the employer is all about, what they're looking for, what the jobs are, 
uh, what the application process look like so they're prepared to really go ahead and make those good referrals. Uh, so again, just, just developing those partnerships, it takes time. At, you know, at that point, you might not have someone who's going to be good for a warehouse role, and I know that. So six months down the line, as long as we have that working um, partnership, you're able to refer that individual and, and get some good talent in the door. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and then we, operator, do we have any phone questions? No questions from the phone lines, folks. Right, what do we got? Um, one last one from Alan Krolik, who is curious about whether there is a Canadian organization or any Canadian companies doing similar work. Uh, <laughs> uh, Julie, I, I was going to say something about that. I think the work we're doing, I, I think it's a very, um, I'll say rare, it's not the right word, but the, the work we're doing, again, we're, we're proving with results that our programs are working, our clients are bought in, the employers are bought in, uh, community-based organizations, the job stickers are all bought in. It, it's been a, a great work with Disability Solutions. You know, we are based out of Connecticut, but work across the country. Uh, Julie's actually started some work in India. Uh, so although we are headquartered in um, America, we, we definitely are interested in doing some work in Canada. But as far as I know, I don't know if there's any company doing what we do. And the fact that there really isn't is precisely why I wanted to share your work and share your insights about changing minds and changing lives. Um, thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, for all the people uh, participating in our webinar, um, we'll send you a PDF copy of the slides and uh, some of those links to further resources so you can kind of learn what they're learn more what they're doing and kind of figure out how to adapt it to your own work. Um, and then next up, I also want to invite you to our next and our last webinar for 2017. And this one's going to be a little bit different. So um, usually with our webinars, we're focused on employment because we all that's what our organization does. We work on Hollywood, we work on jobs, and you know, we when we look at our job work, we always are very focused on youth with disabilities. It's where the best alignment of resources, programs, and pathways really exist. However, next week's webinar is going to be different. We're specifically going to be talking about return to work and stay at work strategies with an expert who has been working on those issues for 30 years. I'm very pleased that on uh, Wednesday, December 13th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, I'm going to be speaking directly with Jennifer Christian, MD, who is really in a very interesting thought leader when it comes to that specific segment of what happens when somebody ages into a disability, who acquires a disability, that whole complex process of accessing insurance, accessing supports, and you know getting back to education, getting back to work. Um, it's going to be a little different, a little interesting, and I hope that all of you who are here today will join us for that. Um, this webinar and recording and slides will go up on our website pretty soon, so if you ever if you have a question come up and you want to go back and check on something you learned today, you will be able to do that. Thank you again so much. I know there were a few technical difficulties, but I appreciate your patience, and I hope that um, we'll sign up for next week's webinar, and I hope to see you in the new year. Take care, and good luck. <laughs>